This year was huge for AI. Already now, neural networks can achieve superhuman performance in many tasks. Computers can already program themselves and can write text which is indistinguishable from human speech. But how do we bring all this intelligence into the real world, into devices like phones and robots? And here, neuromorphic computing seems to be the best choice. The idea of neuromorphic is to replicate the biological brain in silicon in order to build the most efficient computer chips. Um, so, so the way I look at it is if you're wanting to deploy intelligence to the data center and you're going to have, you know, vast troves of knowledge that are built up in data sets, uh, databases that exist on disk right next to those processors, conventional architectures are probably going to do very well for a long period of time uh, for that. Um, on the other hand, if you want to deploy the intelligence out into the world in systems, in your vehicles, into robots, um, uh, or even into just your cell phone, maybe, you know, that that there's that real time interaction that's required. That's where neuromorphic uh, computing will, will really thrive and succeed in the future. Intel is working on such a neuromorphic chip called Loihi 2. They're basically taking the very latest understanding of what we know about the brain and putting it into a computer chip, which is built in the state-of-the-art Intel 4 process node. What excites me the most about this concept is that it basically turns upside down the way we think about computing and artificial intelligence. The first paradigm shift that it's not using synchronous clock, like all the chips do. The information is encoded and processed in spikes, just like in our brain. This means when a spike is happening or communication from one neuron to the next, then the circuit is activated. We don't use a, a synchronous clock, which is um, the standard conventional way of designing just about every you know commercial chip that you might buy is a, is designed in a synchronous paradigm so lowe is different in that we we have asynchronous handshaking uh, signals at the lowest level and the the circuits only activate when there is some kind of useful work to be performed so in in this paradigm of spiking neural network chips that we're we're building here that means that there's some kind of a spike or a communication from one neuron to the next then the circuits activate and there's handshaking and the spike is passed through the network um, of, of neurons and, and it's processed as it goes. But that's in contrast to a conventional design where you are strobing all of the flops all together, you know, with this global clock and the information is flowing in this very synchronized way. Um, that's not how brains are processing information. Brains are processing information through these spikes where the timing of those spikes is actually encoding information. What is interesting that such a neuromorphic chip is intended for running spiking neural networks. And this is a whole new different class of neural networks in comparison to conventional neural networks. Conventional models are trained using supervised learning approach. It is trained on a labeled data set and the weights and biases are updated frequently based on the error between actual and predicted output. Basically, conventional neural networks are a sort of a static functions. It takes input from many neurons and computes a single output. This is so-called ralo function. But um, spiking neural networks are very different in that they have internal state, they have temporal state, so that the timing of when you present the input to these neurons matters. If you give it an, an input and you wait a little while, that internal state decays away and then the neuron returns to its initial state. But if you get two inputs arriving from two different inputs at the same time, that, that it, it will have a stronger activation and then it might fire at that point in time. So there, it's a very different class of networks because they're they're more like filters. They're temporally behaving as opposed to being static input-output functions. So so that opens up a whole wide class of different types of algorithmic uh, algorithms and computation that spiking neural networks can perform compared to deep learning models. And we certainly don't look at um, Loihi or neuromorphic architecture as simply a better way to run these deep learning models. Um, it's possible to do that, to take deep learning models and map them 
into low EE and run them, but these are never the best uh, performing examples. The best performing examples are always rethinking neural network processing to make use of this kind of temporal uh, quality of, of the neurons. Um, so, so that's why they're, they're good for temporal time series processing. They're good for optimization problems because as you loop around these neurons, these networks, and you create recurrent networks, loops of these, they, the, the spiking system forms a, uh, a, a dynamical system mathematically is how we define that, that, that moves to an equilibrium point. So rather than compute some clear output as a function of the inputs, it's more of like a, uh, a, a pond where you throw a stone in the pond and there's all these interactions between the water molecules and these ripples. And, and then there's, you know, that, that pattern of rippling is maybe the answer to the computation of what you're, you're seeking. And spiking neural networks uh, rarely fire spikes. That's why they actually shuffle less data than a typical neural network and require less power. In general, CNNs are proven to be more efficient for real-world applications to the kind of problems which our brain used to solve, like processing video or audio or single stream, so where there is a temporal content in the signal. This is exactly the type of problem which chips like Loy here is able to solve in the most efficient way. Um, today, if you look at the progress that's being made, um, I mean, the, it's it's uh, very, very exciting what's happening with conventional architectures and conventional very large, you know, transformer networks, right? Um, so I would not bet against this conventional architecture in, in terms of um, overcoming the limitations today that it faces. But I think where neuromorphic architecture clearly thrives, and I think that it, it's very clear that it will succeed in the long term, I believe, is where you, we need to deploy this intelligence into devices that respond to real world change and stimulus and, and have to um, control systems. So in response to that stimulation, uh, make decisions decisions, inferences, adapt to add, you know, to its knowledge uh, and, and to do that in this real-time setting. Another fundamental difference of neuromorphic approach is distributed memory. You know, one of the key bottlenecks of the traditional computers based on von Neumann architecture is the separation of compute and memory. Moving the data between the CPU and the memory is often inefficient. And this becomes particularly critical when we are dealing with large amounts of data in real time. While our brain is built entirely different, in our brain the memory is distributed and each computing node gets its own local memory. And brain can access it anytime without a need to wait for some clock. So one of the most fundamental properties of neuromorphic architecture is that there's no external memory. The, the memory, which in a conventional processor is the DRAM, you know, or your cache, right, that's sitting apart from the, the processor, in some cases far on a different chip, right, in the case of DRAM. Um, that, that's not the case in a neuromorphic architecture. The memory elements are intertwined at a very fine scale. They're, they're close to the processing elements where the neural processing is happening. In this way, the bottleneck we just discussed is eliminated, and the energy consumption drops by a factor of 100 or even 1,000 times and this is actually why we are driving inspiration from our brain, because this is the most efficient computing engine that we know. We have examples where we have over three orders of magnitude gains in energy delay product, that product. So over a thousand times uh, improvement over the, the best possible conventional solutions. This is what makes neuromorphic chips like Loy here so well suited for robotics because robots often need to operate for long periods of time on a single battery and also quickly adapt to the change in the real world and take action. Uh, people see neuromorphic as being kind of the final correct, you know, right architecture suited for robotics because brains evolved to control bodies and organisms, right? And their movement through the world and understanding and adapting to real-time sensor input. So there's been um, certainly some examples in the robotics domain. So things like controlling robotics arms with 
adaptation. So learning using some of the learning capabilities in the chip to uh, understand if the the uh, kinematics of the arm or, you know, say if there's friction that develops in the arm or something that changes about the model of that of that arm, that system, Loihi can adapt in real time to compensate for, you know, those kind of changes and perturbations that may, may experience. Um, there's been other examples of of learning objects in a kind of an active sensing way in the in the way that you know when when we try to detect a new object you know we, our, our attention might move towards it and we might you know study it a little bit and then we form a kind of a pattern in our mind of template of what that new object is and there's been some work using the iCub uh, robot to to demonstrate that kind of, of interactive object learning on on Loihi as well. But um, you know other examples in in other areas as well. So uh, things like optimization problems and planning. Uh, so you know one thing that our brains are doing all the time are you know solving optimization problems. Whether that's the best path for me to move from my kitchen to my living room, or um, you know kind of charting the course of you know how I'm going to plan my day, or or just even moving my arm to avoid obstacles. This is something that we do completely effortlessly, and and it, and it's been no surprise that we found that we there are networks that run well on Loihi that solve similar kinds of planning and optimization uh, problems. Eventually, we want neurons to learn while they compute. The idea is to get computers to the point where they can think creatively, recognize objects or people they've never seen before, and create something which hasn't existed before. And neuromorphic computing is one of the most promising approaches here. I find this research very exciting, but at the same time very challenging. And for sure Intel wants to commercialize this chip in the near future and bring it into the Intel products. We've already talked about using Neuromorphic for HAI in gadgets and robots. Another possibility would be to embed it into an Intel SOC to add extra intelligence to the chip. Apart from Intel, there are other companies working in the same direction, like startup Brain Chip from Australia, who are developing the neuromorphic chip Akita. This year, their hardware is integrated into Mercedes cars. It is used for keyword spotting, for voice control. You know, when you say, hey, Mercedes, and according to Mercedes, neuromorphic chips are at least 10 times more efficient than conventional chips for voice control. I have a separate video about it. You can watch it later. And of course, there is another way to build neuromorphic chips, so in analog fashion. So instead of using standard cells to implement neurons and synapses, it is based on analog cells like memristors. And one of the recent designs here is, for instance, NeurRAM chip. This chip is based on resistive, non-volatile memory, and it allows to compute directly in the memory. This technology is actually not new, but usually it leads to loss in accuracy. But this guy seems to solve this problem. This chip achieves 99% accuracy on a handwritten digits, 85% on image classification task. This is actually comparable to digital chips, but achieved at much lower power consumption. IBM and MIT also working on another interesting research. They found that using electrochemical RAM, so-called ECRAM, is also perfectly suited for building memory for neuromorphic chips. And this device draws inspiration from batteries. Now, a team at IBM is working on manufacturing such a device. Definitely, we have to keep an eye on this research. Well, one thing is clear. Neuromorphic computing has huge potential. And this biologically inspired approach for running neural networks seems to be the best hardware choice for the future, at least for age. And thanks for watching, guys. I wish you to have beautiful holidays, and I will see you in the next video. Ciao!